Mercy family. We are in week three of our four-week guest preacher series, and man, if there's one that I wish I could be here for, it would definitely be this week, because this week, Pastor Chuck Reed, uh, who planted Rebuild Church in Durham, North Carolina just a few years ago, he is preaching for us, and Chuck is a dear, dear brother to me personally. He has been such an encourager to my faith and to my ministry. The Lord has gifted this man. I told you, each week what you're seeing is just different giftings that have been so impactful to me, and I wanted to share those with Mercy Church, and that's certainly the case the way that Chuck, just uh, the joy of the Lord comes through him and through his preaching and teaching, and it has revived my soul so many times, and I know that's going to happen for our church this morning. Uh, just a dear friend and a fellow uh, church planter in the Summit Collaborative, so if you're trying to point someone towards a church in the Raleigh-Durham area, that's another one of the churches that we love, Rebuild Church there in Durham. But listen, I don't want to take up any more of his time. I want you to get ready as best you can for the word that Pastor Chuck has. You better interact with him, respond to him. He has such a good word for us. Mercy Church, will you join me in welcoming Pastor Chuck Reed to the Mercy Pulpit? Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Man, can I uh, record and savor this moment? I didn't know I was going to get this type of billing. Uh, man, I'm so honored to be here. This is the house that the Lord built, known as Mercy Church, and so I'm so thankful to be with you here on this morning. I remember the early days, the early days when you all were meeting in the, it was a senior center, I believe it was, and had the honor to come be there and, and celebrate Jesus with you all there and to see not only what God has done, but what he is doing it is truly marvelous in my eyes this morning. So I just want to celebrate Jesus to uh, our online family, our Northeast and Providence Road family. Can we all just celebrate the greatness of our God this morning? Oh, God is doing something in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, uh, as Pastor Spence said, my name is Chuck Reed. I have the honor and privilege of being, I, I, I like to say, the lead servant. I know it's the lead pastor, but I'm the lead servant of Rebuild Fellowship in the Bull City. It's how we rep out there in the Bull City. So, we came to bring the noise up in here today. So, y'all guys, you, you, you family, you know, online family, Providence Road, Northeast family, y'all been having this opportunity to have this, uh, uh, these theological brains that have come before me. So, if I think of this like a theological sandwich, you've had them here. You had Andrew Hopper. You had the great Dean and Sarah. And then you're going to have uh, 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 Chancellor Kruger, whatever, whatever, however he's titled. And then you got this this honey spicy mustard in the middle. <laughs> so that's what I come to do. I come to be a little spicy mustard this morning. And so as Pastor Smith says, the word really does get like fire shot up in my bones. And so I get very passionate in my delivery. So for my white brothers and sisters here, <laughs> don't think I'm yelling at you. Right? We just going to have a good old time in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So there it is. Now, with that being said, uh, the Lord has given me two messages. I didn't know which message I was going to preach at the 9, which one I was going to preach at the 11. Both of them are in line with us remembering, maybe for you for the very first time, coming into knowing the greatness and goodness of our God. The song that we just sang, Victory Belongs to Jesus, these two messages that the Lord has given me, I hope that you will begin to enter in and engage with the truth of that statement. That victory belongs to Jesus. And nothing your God can ever do is a failure. I'm already in my message and I'm getting a little happy, sir. I might need you just a little bit later. And so the song confirmed which message I needed to preach in this moment at this time. And so for the production team, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so very much for serving the way you serve. If you could take me to my notes in uh, uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's a familiar story, familiar patches of scripture. We're going to look at David and Goliath again today. 
before we get into that, I want to do two things. One, well, actually, I'm going to do a few things very quickly. And I know, listen, I'm a, I'm a black preacher, so clocks mean nothing to me. <laughs> he wanted diversity. He asked me to come, so I'm just telling you. Now, I'm not standing up here saying I'm going to be openly rebellious or disobedient. I'm just telling you, when black people get in the presence of God, we know nothing about time. Did I make a few of y'all uncomfortable? Like, oh, God, I got to send an email to Spence. I don't know what he thought about. I need to give my, I need to turn over my resignation right now. I need to get up out of here. But we're going to talk about the goodness and greatness of Jesus this morning. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave out encouraged. Listen to what this, listen to what this word. This, this is a very important, uh, I call it an anchor verse in my soul. Listen to this. It says in Romans 15 verse 4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. I want you to be encouraged today. The, 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 the anointing, if you will, that the Spirit of the Lord has given me is to encourage you to endure. Let me say it the way the old church mother used to say it to me back in the day. Say, baby, everything is going to be all right. So I come today to minister from that posture, minister, minister from that intent. And before I go any further, let me just thank my Rebuild family for being here with me today, coming alongside and giving me strength. Being here, this is my Rebuild crew. They were the ones standing up. Now, that don't usually happen at home, so that's why it was a shock to me. But I guess I am loved at home, so there it is. But I can't, I'd be remiss if I did not celebrate my chocolate sunshine. The gift of God's grace known as Yolanda Reed, who is my, oh, my God, she's so good to my soul. In other words, I'm still in love 20 years in. I'm still in love. Amen. Amen. Two children and two grandchildren later, I'm still in love. I know what you was thinking. He's a grandfather. Yes, I am. And I look so good to be a grandfather. <laughs> I know you was thinking. He don't look like he's a grandfather. I want to tell you, I just don't look the part. I look so good in the part. Amen. Somebody. <laughs> Here we go. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this moment. God, you are so very good. God, we need you. Jesus, you made it clear in John chapter 15. Apart from you, we can do nothing. I can't speak about you without you. I can't serve these people without you. I can't grow in grace in the knowledge of you without you. So, Jesus, I want to do what your servant, the Apostle John, made a decision to do. Decrease so that you would increase in and through me. But, Lord, if I'm honest, that doesn't just apply to me. It applies to each and every one of us in this room. I pray, Lord God, that this passage of Scripture, we won't see through familiar eyes. It's familiar eyes that tend to keep us bound. God, give us freedom eyes today, eyes to see that you are good, and beside you there is absolutely no other Savior. To you be all the honor, and I mean all the honor and glory. Lord Jesus, meet with us, speak to us, heal us as only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Those that agree, say it. The year was 1977. 1977. This rock band had just come on the scene, and they had a hit song that was beginning to take the world by storm. And they're at this event. They're at this this concert hall, and they put on a great show. So much so that the crowd calls back for them to come out and do an encore. And so they come back out, and they do an encore. And oh, 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 the crowd is riled up again. And they don't want to leave the presence of this band. It's such a rich moment. Everybody ever been at a concert and it just flows so good? Don't act like you're saved now. Everybody ever been at a concert and it got good to your soul? And you just sat there and it was a moment that you never want to leave from. Ain't that what Will I Am said? I got a feeling. 
and he just said that, that tonight's going to be. Y'all know, y'all don't try to play me like you don't know the song. So he says, watch this. you in that moment. And the crowd was like, oh, my goodness. So they came out and did an encore. And after they did the encore, they're walking off stage. So they're going back in, and they're like, man, we just killed it, man. We did the thing, and we just, we just enjoying ourselves. And then all of a sudden, the crowd begins to sing back to them. They begin to sing this song that's used at European football games, a song that is like their anthem. It's their anthem of victory. It's their anthem of joy. And they begin to peek out from the curtains, and they're wondering what has happened to them. The crowd has begun to sing with, as, as Romans 15 later will say, in that next verse it says, with one voice they were glorifying the band that just came off stage. It was a very surreal moment. So the band leader said, man, we got to have something like that. So what they did was they decided that they were going to go into their musical chambers, and two of the leaders did this separately. One wrote one song, the other wrote another song, and these two songs are now a tandem, and now they're a staple of our society. The group that I'm talking about is Queen. The song that I'm referring to is We Will Rock You, and We Are the Champions. So today I want to read from a passage of scripture from David and Goliath to minister to you hopefully to encourage and equip you that we're going to rock the enemy. Come on. We Some of y'all thinking it's weird. Are we supposed to be doing this in church? Yes. Say it with your chest. You can stand on your feet if you want. Three more times. One for the Father. One for the Son. Last for the Holy Ghost. Now yell to the top of your lungs. Thank you, Jesus. Here we go. First Samuel. First Samuel. First Samuel. Here we go. Here in this moment, Saul has been anointed king. Kind of upset God because they had no business asking for a king because he was there all in all. But you know how we do. We don't think what God has already provided us with is enough. It's not good enough that he provided us with his son that has brought us this great salvation in which we stand in. God, I need you to give me a sign. God, I need you to do this again. It's not good enough that he said, I'll be with you to the end of the age. My name is Emmanuel, God with you. That's not enough. We need more. And so after all that God had done, delivered them from the bondage that they suffered in Egypt, bringing them out from the hand of Pharaoh, feeding them in the wilderness, all bringing them into the promised land, it was not enough. We needed more. If we're honest, it P.O. God. And he said, listen here, they want a king now, but Samuel, here's what I want you to do. Don't trip on that, because they ain't rejecting you, they rejecting me. I got that under control. Because one day, they're going to call for me again. And I'm going to be right there. He ain't the type of God that gets in his feelings and say, because you rejected me, I'm just going to step on out the picture and let you go on about your business. You figure life out on your own strength. He says, hey, when you come to the end of yourself, you are now at the beginning of faith, and I'm going to be right there with my arms wide open. So he says, Samuel, don't trip. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go anoint Saul. That's the one I want him to do. But here goes Saul, thinking he know a better way. Lord sends them into battle. God tells him how he's going to get the victory, what he's supposed to do when he gets the victory. And what does he do? He does opposite of what God told him to do. And then when God brought the consequences of his situation to light, what did he say? Oh, God, no, 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 my bad. See, listen, see, what had happened was 
Y'all know all of us in here got that what it happened was spirit. God, I know you said that I was supposed to go forgive, but what it happened was I had worked a long day and I was kind of tired and was kind of hungry, so I didn't make that phone call. So he said, he said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. I said, okay, okay. Now, my spirit going to leave you, right? I ain't going to use you, but there's somebody else I'm going to use, and that's going to be the one that's going to serve me. That's going to be the one that I anoint to help bring victory to my people, right? And so Saul, a little upset about that, but here's something interesting with that. There's in 1 Samuel chapter 14, there's this verse in there that says, the Philistines and Saul were fighting all of his days, and they weren't just fighting, they were fighting hard. Some of you have lived lives where it seems like all of your days you've been in a fight. Oh, if I had to bring in uh, 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 Miss Sophia from the color purple, she said, baby, all my days I've had to fight. And many of you have been fighting. You've been fighting to win the approval of your parent. You've been fighting to win the approval of your loved one. You've been fighting to get your finances. You've been fighting to get respected. You've been fighting, fighting, fighting. You've been fighting things in your flesh. You've been dealing with an illness or sickness. And it's like, God, when does the fight end? My GBA can't GPA enough. Because if it did, these student loans won't be student loaning like they student loaning. All my life, I had to fight. So here it is. So he comes and he anoints David. And so David is the one that nobody's really considering. God said, look, don't worry about that. Don't look on the outward. Look where? Don't worry about how you look. God got that covered. Some of us are chasing the images that we see from social media, these images that we see in celebrities and other. God said, no, 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 no. You're beautiful because you're created in my image and in my likeness. Can't nobody ascribe beauty to you like I ascribe beauty to you. So he says, don't worry about that, Scott. He said, don't worry about that. Don't trip. I'm going to use him, right? So he goes up there. Now, David is chilling. David minding his own business. He in the pasture. He dealing with the sheeps. He dealing with the snakes, he dealing with the bears, he dealing with the lions. He out there ruddy, but he handsome. He's a little, and he a little short thing. He over there doing his thing. (laughs) Short people, don't get mad at the tall people. Let them know. It's people in the Bible. God used a a, a short person to do big things. Amen? Amen. So there you are. Y'all still with me now? Y'all say, we're a little more comfortable now. Y'all a little more comfortable with me now. Here we go. So then we said, so then, so then he goes, right. So then he comes, and now all of a sudden, then the big battle. So the Philistines are hot. They really want to fight now. Because there was a victory that they just got that they didn't like too much. So here we go again. Now the Philistines are saying, remember, the scripture says, all the days of Saul, they had hard fighting. So here comes a hard fight. Here comes big boy. Big boy steps out there, and now we are in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start reading from the first verse. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokar, or however you say it, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokar and Ezekah, and Ephes Demim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered in the camp in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the, uh, on the one side, and Israel stood on the other side. So it's just like this. Consider yourself for this moment. Israel to my left, Philistines to the right. Don't get in your feelings, Philistines, right? This is just for dramatization purposes. Like they do on a commercial at the bottom, for dramatization purposes. That's what we're doing right now, dramatization purposes. So Israel over here, Philistines over here, right? So let's keep reading. And verse 4, there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Scholars think that he's somewhere between 9 and 12 feet. The joker big. Joker big. Now, I don't know about you. Now, it's training camp season. And, well, anyways, it's training camp season. (laughs) I'm 27 years in this fight as a Cowboys fan, but we still holding on. This our year, right? (laughs) This our year. Goliath. I'm I'm facing my own Goliath in a way. And so what I've noticed in training camp, there's some big boys on that line. 
And right, and now the way they're building these linemen now, they from another breed now. I don't know what line they come from. I don't know what biblical line they come from. But what I know is these some big boys. To be like 6'4", 320, running a 4'6", that's a problem for my heart. <laughs> right? But long as they on my squad, I'm good with it. We a problem for everybody else. But on the other side, that's a problem. So we're sitting here, right? We see that Goliath is coming out. This is like, uh, anybody watch Friday before? Anybody seen the movie? This like, this like Debo. Right? <laughs> so here we go. I knew I'd get some of y'all in here. This like Debo. So here we go, right? So he says, watch this. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of male, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. The joker came in like Thanos, and his shield barrel went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If, listen to this, verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants to serve us. Verse 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. My question, right, before we get into the takeaways I want to get to, my question is, what's causing you fear right now? What's your Goliath? And you know what's interesting, right? What's interesting is before Goliath said anything, he appeared, and fear took over the people. Before the enemy or your enemies said anything, fear settled in. Some of you may be looking at parenting as your Goliath. Some of you might be looking at the end of your educational season as a Goliath. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this semester. Some of you may be looking at your financial situation. This is my Goliath. Some of you may be looking at the disconnect in your relationship, whether that's with your spouse, whether that's with your child, whether that's with a beloved relative or beloved friend. The thought of reconciling after you don't even know what happened, how we got to this place, that could be your Goliath. Maybe you're facing an illness in your body. The mere fact that you got a note saying, I need to come for an additional checkup or to do additional blood work has already begun to create that level of fear. It hadn't said a word yet. It just appeared. So he says, verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, verse 12, now David was the son of the Epaphrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his hand, took his stand, excuse me, morning and evening. First thing I want you to see from this, I want you to see is the consecration of David. The consecration of David. Consecration just simply to make something sacred. To, 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 right, to bestow on them the anointing that will cause them to serve in the Lord's army. Something simple as just simply saying to make or declare sacred or to dedicate formally for a religious or divine purpose. David has now been consecrated by the Lord, he's been anointed by the Lord to now begin to usher in faith for the people and remove or extract fear from the people. 
to proclaim the greatness of our God and to defame the greatness supposedly of our enemy. So here he is, consecrated for the Lord's service. I love what one uh, uh, um, sister of the faith says about this. Her name is Brooke. She says, the mark of a saint is not perfection, but consecration. A saint is not a person without faults, but a man or a woman who has given him or herself without reserve to God. A man or a woman who says, for God I live and for God I die. Nothing else matters. So that's the first thing we see. First thing we see, the consecration of David. We're going to keep moving on. So we see at this point, David's going through. He's now consecrated. He's coming around. And for 40 days, this Goliath, he's coming, inflicting fear on the people. For 40 days. For 40 days. Y'all know how it is. For those of you that have been to school before, y'all know how it is leading up to spring break. It's like, dog. <laughs> when is spring or fall break coming? <laughs> like, how many more classes I got to go to? I'm ready to be out. I need some relief. Okay, school people. Let me take school people off. I just served y'all. Watch this. Now, y'all know how it is on your job. You just clocked in at 9 o'clock. It's 1018. And you're like, doggone. If I get another email, I don't know if I want to be here no more. I just don't want a lunch break. I want a I'm out of here break. Anybody ever been there? So you understand what this 40 days of intimidation that Goliath has been giving Israel is looking like. So here we are. <laughs> here we are. Some of y'all, if y'all dealing with somebody crazy in your life you've been trying to have a relationship with, some of y'all need to be having a break from that. You've been trying to love that person too long and they ain't loved you back. I'm talking about outside of marriage now. You inside of marriage, there's a whole nother conversation. I'm talking to the people outside of marriage. Some of y'all pursuing people that don't love you. I don't know where that came from, but I know where it came from. So here we go. Am I still allowed to come back here, sis? Will you write Spence a letter and say, (laughs) if nothing else, he was comical. He gave us a little levity for what we were doing. All right, here we go. So watch this. So he's going up. Everything's going on. They're fearing. And we get to verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man fled from him, were much afraid. They still tripping. So then all of a sudden, verse 25, and the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, David was sent, commissioned by his daddy, to go take them some food. Go check in on them. I want to know how my son's doing. See how they are. David gets out there. He see they tripping. Well, he see and then he hears that they tripping. So then David says, watch this. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this? So I want you to see this right here. Watch this. I want you to see the confidence in David. Not only did David get commissioned by his father to go check in on his sons, and this is typically what happened for us as leaders. We do our check-in every week as best we can to make sure y'all doing all right. But also, this message gets before King Saul, and King Saul says, oh, well, send this joke out. The Lord going to be with you. We, listen, we done tried everything else. He's small, ready, and seemed like he want to do something about this, so... Get on out there, son. <laughs> and that's, what, that's why I love new believers. That's why I love new believers. Because they swear Jesus can do anything. And he can. And he can. But it's the ones that have been in ministry for a little while that fill in the blank. Y'all, y'all the ones. I can say this because this ain't my house. Y'all the ones that give us the most trouble. I know I ain't coming back now. <laughs> I, I know I ain't coming back now. But that's the truth. It's once, you, once, you, once life get on you. And you, and, and, and you wonder, like, what happened? I didn't know. 
Did you want to take that loved one away from me so early, Jesus? I didn't know that serving you, I felt like and literally lost everything. I didn't know. It seemed like my marriage was on track to be on the cover of Time magazine. And all of a sudden, it's now in the newspaper in the obituary section. God, I didn't know. I didn't know life would be like this. What I'm trying to get you to understand is don't lose your humanity. Pick back up your faith. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. But do not lose heart. I have overcome the world. Don't lose your humanity. Pick back up your heart. God wants to heal. Oh, don't surrender your humanity. God loves that about you. He loves for you to express to him how weak you are because he said in that place of weakness, my strength will be made perfect. Don't lose your humanity. Just pick back up your heart. Oh, some of us in here need a spiritual blood transfusion today. Oh, I'm from the old school Baptist church. The blood still works, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, the blood that the songwriter says, give me strength from, to, it will never lose its, come on here, somebody. So now we got the confidence of the Lord. We see David with the confidence of the Lord. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of God? Boy, I used to love, back when my knees were halfway decent, I used to love getting on the court, and I used to be like, yeah, who wants some of this J right here? Y'all thought I was going to say something else, like I was going to dunk on somebody? Nah, just give me my spot, let me fire that thing up, right? I know what to do with it. Now, I'm glad just to run from inline to inline. <laughs> that's, that's my victory nowadays. <laughs> Boy, that back start tightening up, them knees start talking to you, stuff's in your shoulder, I'm like, man. These young bucks, boy, they know what they're doing. And they cross me up out there. They be like, young bucks be crossing me up, and they be leaving me. And I'll be like, dang, this should be retirement day. <laughs> but I'm out here now. I got my new shoes on. I got my ankle bracelets. You know, I should, I should know what I'm doing. But I still hang in the fight because I'm looking for that victory. Now, watch this. He's got confidence. So when I say pick back your heart, I'm saying don't forget. Choose to remember that your God is bad. And beside him, there is none other. Oh, if you thought Michael Jackson was bad when he would, oh, when he would do that, remember, remember how bad he is. You know how Michael used to have little beats on there, little spikes and everything, right? Remember that your God is bad. You know why I'm doing such a bit of comedy relief today? Because life's been heavy, y'all. And what I'm teaching you spiritually, what you did not know is how to lay your weights at the master's feet. Be silly a little bit. We've been sulking too long. It's okay to have, Nehemiah said, it's okay to have the joy of the Lord because that's your strength. Think about all we've endured over the last 27 months. From COVID hit until now, all of the things that have plagued our lives, we've been sulking too long. And I believe God wanted me to come today all the way from Durham, North Carolina, to encourage you, to let you know everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Lift up your head, ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. So the king of glory can come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord God strong and mighty. Who is this king of glory? The Lord God mighty in battle. So this is the, this is the confidence that David is walking in. I love what Joyce Meyer says about this. Yes, I said Joyce Meyer. Yes, I know what church I'm in. So here we go. He says, watch this. 
she says this. She says, no matter what you are going through or what storms you are facing in your life, take your position. Don't give up. Stand still. Listen. Enter God's rest. See the salvation of the Lord. Quit worrying and trying to figure out everything that is happening around you. And above all, worship God. Remember, no matter what your battle is, it is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And he has a plan to bring you to victory. Somebody say, God's got a plan. plan. With my name on it. Somebody say, God's got a plan. With my name on it. Somebody say, God's got victory. With my name on it. Somebody say, God's got healing. With my name on it. God's got provision. With my name on it. God's got protection. With my name on it. And if you're an unbeliever in the room, you can say today, God has my salvation. He bared my name on him. Is this good? Is this helpful? Is this? Right, here we go. Here we go. Here's the next thing I want you to see. Right? We're traveling through here. We go on. We see in verse 45. Right? I'm skipping down a few. Probably done passed up some stuff, so I got real happy with y'all. Here we go. Verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. You got all his weapons. You got all this armor, right? You tall, you big, you think you bad, you dressing the part, looking the part, even like standing and talking the part. You come to me with all this. Watch what he says. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, somebody say this day. Somebody say this day. This day, watch this, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air. Look how, look how reckless David talking right now, right, <laughs> to the birds of the air. Ain't nobody else talking like this. This man literally said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill everybody with you, and when I kill you to let them know how bad I am, I'm going to chop your head off, and I'm going to feed all y'all to the birds and the beast. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a time and in a culture where you needed somebody that knew how to knock somebody out. Because depending, I come from a culture where it won't too many clean fights. You got jumped. So if you go to school, it's, 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 some of y'all ain't grew up in the hood. Some of y'all grew up like in the rural areas. So I want to talk to the more suburban, rural people. Like if you wouldn't like somebody, they would talk about you and they would get a group of people like we're seeing with the Philistines that would talk bad about you and they would wait for the opportunity to jump you. Because what has happened is a cancer has spread in the camp and they decided all of them don't like you. So all of them wanted to knock you out. And all you knew was to have one rider on your side. One rider with a knockout blow. Because what I need you to do is while I'm handling a couple, I need you just going around knocking out. We ain't got time. It's too many of them. I just need, I can handle two, but you can handle eight. Because you're just going to go around. You see what I'm saying? And like manner, David is saying, look, I got God. Now, I'm going to stand right here. I'm going to take my position in front of you, and I'm going to proclaim that you will not take us out. And some of us fathers need to stand up in the face of the enemy that's trying to get our children to say, "Uh uh-uh, as for me and my house. So he says, watch this. He says, the beasts of the earth and all that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, and that all... This assembly may know that the Lord, listen, does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into your hand. Would you close your eyes in this moment, those that are willing? Those that want to get out of familiar and get into faith. Let me 
read this over you and into you again. And that all this assembly here today, known as Mercy Church, whether you're online, whether you're at this campus or Providence Road, listen what he says. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into your hand. Father, these your people need to notice. I pray right now you're melting away anything in their mind and in their heart that would distract them from this truth. As I read earlier from Romans 15, that these things were written to teach us to endure and give us encouragement from the scriptures so that we may have hope. God, through this one verse alone, I pray that hope is now rising within each and every man, woman, boy, or girl that's in this room right now or online watching right now. The Lord is their strong tower. And that he doesn't save according to conventional or traditional methods. He saves according to his will and his workmanship. Because he is God. And he knows how to bring victory in a situation. So, Father, I pray that through this moment, you're infusing into their lives the truth of the Lord. That whatever they're facing right now. It's not their battle. They can literally go on the sideline and get some water, get refreshed, enter into the Lord's rest, and look on the jumbotron and watch you do your work. Father, it's in your name I pray and ask this in faith. Amen. Here's the last thing, last two things I want to show you. What I just pointed out to you, I wanted to show you the conquering of David. Listen to this. We're almost done. The conquering David. Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. I had my little slingshot. I forgot it. Um, you got it, baby? Got it. Let, me, let me show you. A little slingshot right here. You got a little time? Yeah, I got about three minutes. Here we go. Got a little time right here. Is this all right? This is what I have? So I went to the dollar store for y'all. This how. <laughs> I'm still hot there dollar twenty-five now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't go in there on my sprees like I wanted to. Watch this. What did David do? It wasn't the sling or the stone that brought him victory. Because he was in Christ, in relationship with the sovereign God of the universe, he was already positioned from victory, not for it. Some of y'all still trying to purchase what God has already given. That's not the gospel. The gospel is we were so rebellious, so stiff-necked, so undeserving that God was rich in mercy, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. And through that process, he would seat us in the heavenly places. He would seat us with him in victory. You became what's known as the Bible in the Bible as a joint heir. You ain't got to work for nothing no more. Ask the kids of Walmart. Y'all know it. The Sam Walton kids got to work for anything anymore. They straight. If they cashed out right now, they good. How much more, if your earthly father being evil can give you good things, how much more would your father in heaven provide to you. He's already given you victory first over sin and death. Next, he's given you victory over the enemy. And so before David even stepped up with his equipment, right, he had already had the victory because he had knowledge in his mind and in his heart of who his God is and what his God was well able to do. And so when he hurled this rock at him, he already knew what was going down. And then from that part, did y'all like that little pun I threw in there? 
Well, watch this one. So watch this. He already knew what was going down. And then from that point, he knew because of the faith that he had in God, God was always going to teach him how to get ahead in life. <laughs> David conquered. Last thing I want to show you is the conversion instituted through David. Last thing I want to show you is the conversion. Verse 52, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shireem as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. Verse 54, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. And as soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Beth." Himalite. There's a conversion that took place here. The conversion takes place when the people of God, and you'll see this later in chapter 18, you'll see this where the people of God were now transferred from the valley of fear to the village of faith. They no longer declared themselves to be victim because of one man's obedience and faith, they were now brought in to an identity of victor because of one man's obedience. That's the goodness of the gospel. There was an early man because of his disobedience. It brought us into a life of hardship. To put it mildly. But through one man's obedience, he brought us into a position of wealth. David now left his father's house and now was put into the king's house. Remember what I just said from Ephesians chapter 2? God has now seated us in the heavenly places. There was a transferring, right, out of, as uh, Colossians says, out of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous son. Where am I going with this? When you enter into relationship with King Jesus, you get your transfer papers. Oh, I don't know if any athletes are in the room, but some of y'all been, been been thinking about the transfer portal. I want you to think about it from another realm. Think about how you're going from one team to the victorious team. Think about how God has making you, you were an enemy, now he's making you a friend of God. You were not a child of God, now you are becoming a child of God. As First Peter says, you were once a people who did not obtain mercy, now you have obtained mercy. And so you're a peculiar people. You are a royal priest. Priesthood, and this all came through one man's obedience. And through that one man's obedience, that he would come and live a perfect and sinless life. That's still the good news of the gospel, that Christ did and still does for us what we were unable and still unable to do for ourselves. His sinless life, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, his ascension and his seating can put some real perspective on our lives. In other words, Jesus did everything necessary to save you, and he's still standing with arms wide open and saying, I'm still about that life. So would you receive your conversion today? We sang it. A.W. Tozer said, here's the last shock point. A.W. Tozer said, Christians don't tell lies, we sing them. So the next time we sing victory belongs to Jesus, I want it now to begin to click even more. Oh, no, I can't sing it the same way I used to. Because if I'm going to sing it, I got to mean it. 
Because what I'm doing is I'm declaring that my God is bad. Oh, your God is bad. Let me tell you, he has no zeros in his lost column. So would you receive him today? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, there's two camps. There's a camp of us as believers, the house of Israel. And God, we've gotten weary in our well-doing. And you know it, Jesus. You see us every day. You know us. You know what we go through. Life has been hard. There's a lot of moments where we wanted to give up. A lot of times we lean into certain things like I don't have community or nobody's called to check up on me or they ain't played my right song. It's hard being a parent. It's hard working at this job. It's hard being a business owner and the list goes on and on. It is hard. There's a songwriter said, you never told us the road would be easy, but I don't believe you brought us this far to leave us. So, Jesus, for the camp of Israel, God, I thank you for encouraging them today. Letting them know not to get weary in well-doing, for they will reap in due season if they do not lose heart. Father, my prayer is for the believing camp that they would not lose heart. And any place that we have chosen to uh, 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 exalt something over you and your promises, Lord God, I pray that we would take this moment to repent. Say, God, I'm sorry for trusting in whatever we trusted in, whatever that blank or blanks are for our lives, Lord God. Forgive us for trusting in those things more than we trusted in you and your promises. Help us, King Jesus. Restore to us, as King David said, the joy of your salvation. Cast not away, cast us not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from us. King David even said out of that, then uphold me with a willing spirit so I teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return unto you. Help us as your sons and daughters endure. God, there's the other camp, the camp of the Philistines. And for some reason, all the way going back to the very first sin, the original sin. Every single day it has, the enemy has allowed a narrative that you're not good, that you're not real, that you're not strong enough. The enemy has even used examples of men and women of faith who were imperfect And he's tried to use that to continue to keep us blind to say, them Christians ain't no good. Them Christians don't know what they're talking about. Them Christians are foolish. Them Christians, they're judgmental. Them Christians, them Christians, them Christians. And that's created an even taller and thicker wall of hostility between them and you. I pray that today for one or two or 20 or 70 of us here in the room that our believers are standing like David. And we're going to declare the greatness of our God in that way because we want them to come into the other camp. To know the goodness and the steadfast love of King Jesus. To know that there's nothing that they can do that's going to make God love them anymore. It's nothing that they have done that's going to make God love them any less. His love is unconditional, it's undying, it's steadfast, and it never loses its power. It's not judgmental. It's judicial, but it's not judgmental. Pray, Lord God, that they would see you in all of your beauty and splendor in this moment and say, Lord, I surrender all. All to thee. My blessed Savior, I surrender all. Whatever camp we're in, Jesus, it's abundantly clear that without you, we can do no thing. So help us, Holy Spirit. Help us as only you can. In Christ's name.